joining us today live on set, a special guest. I don't think there's ever been a one-armed rider to make it to the full TT, which is what my uh, goal is, is to see if I can actually make it to the Isle of Man TT. It does take quite a while to get there, so we're looking probably about 2023 maybe. What's up motor people? My name's Neil and this is the Moto Chat Show. We have an awesome guest coming up for you tonight. He's racing in the British Thunder Sports Leagues and he's actually looking to become the first one-armed person to race the Isle of Man TT circuit in 2023. Ladies and gentlemen, Moto people, please welcome my special guest, Mr. Chris Ganley. How are you doing, Chris? Yeah, not too bad. Just, um, yeah, just trying to find my feet again, to be honest. So, um, yeah, just got back from Cadwell Park, just trying to blow out some cobwebs. The last couple of days? Uh, I only did the day yesterday. Right. So, How yeah. did it go? How's the bike? Yeah, it's uh, still well out of my, uh, my uh, skill level. Um, but, yeah, and I was doing some good times. Yep. I was holding the same... Um, yeah, just it was roughly about the same lap time as I was doing in my, my last race. But I was getting held up in a few of the corners, but that was kind of justified. Um, but yeah, no, I was just trying to get set up on the bike, ready for the race at the end of the month. Did you like Kedwell? Yeah. It's my hardest track. Uh -huh, it's, it's, so, it's so twisty. It's um, I'm trying to get faster at it as well. Yeah. So, yeah, just still trying to get used to flicking the bike around. What's a good time around Cadwell for you? For me, it's um, just in the 140s, just just inside. So you race in the Thundersport? Yes, yeah. Okay. So just to let people know, you race around in the Thundersport at 140, did you say? Yes, yeah. So what would a, um, a BSB racer go around there in? <laughs> it, that's going to make me sound really embarrassed. <laughs> no, they're, really. they're doing um, they're doing a 126. They're doing a 126. So there's only like 15 seconds difference. Yeah, but finding a second's quite difficult, let alone 14. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, I used to be in the business of helping sprinters shave off one tenth of a second in their yeah. run. That was my job as a as a um, uh, an athletics um, therapist, basically. But yeah. shaving off tenths of a second in motorcycling and f and for hundredths of a second requires a hell of a lot of engineering and a lot of mental toughness, I would have thought. I want to know what the difference is in the way you feel riding a bike and what you have to do to get one second faster over your best ever. How tough to be is honest, that? yeah, most of it... Um... Because I've kept my bike stock, it's completely stock. I haven't really done much upgrades. Um, I've done a couple, but that was more about just being able to race. Um, yep. So basically, I'm adding little things here and there to try and find out. As long as I've got good control over the bike, I'll then move up and try and get more, more out of it. Yep. So at the moment, I'm not changing my gearing at all. Right. I've got one set set sprocket sets um and i'm just trying to get the best out of it as i can what and about what, what about sorry what about getting the best out i mean you physically pushing yourself to the limit just to get that little bit faster do you can you come off a track at the end of a race and know that you've gone faster than you've ever gone before because you you get some kind of feeling or does that make to sense to be honest yeah, it, to be honest, it's one of those that when you think you're going fast, you actually tend to be going slower. I was 25 when I lost my arm in a motorbike accident. I lost my left arm on impact, broke my back in three places, broke my ribs down my left side, popped lung, and I was put in an induced coma for over a week. So the more comfortable you feel about coming off, you generally get faster because you're comfortable with it. When you start feeling a little bit, um, when you start trying to push the boat out too far, you end up 
subconsciously uh, subconsciously scaring yourself slightly, which then makes you back off. And it's all about trying to be consistent and smooth, right. which is what I'm finding. And it's normally what I do is I only work on one corner. So if I know that I'm struggling in one of the corners, instead of trying to work out four or five, I'll just focus on that one until I get better at it and then move on to the next. And it's um, because obviously having the one arm, it's quite hard in the braking. Sure. Because trying to push up, trying to take the weight of the bike, it's, yeah, it's quite difficult trying to keep stay off the bar while heavy braking. Right. And I can't lean off the bike to heavy brake. So it's all just trying to get a feel for how late I can brake now and how much pressure I can put in without actually upset unsettling the bike too much. Right. So, yeah, that's what I'm aiming on at the moment. So I have my scary moments because I try and get those scary moments because I know I'm pushing it that little bit further. But so yeah, that- normally it's when you're more comfortable with it, you, you end up taking the time down without even knowing it. And yeah, that to me, it was just like, this is where I want to be going. You are everywhere I go. Yeah, that kind of makes sense. I've heard sportsmen say when they've done something truly amazing and somebody asked them, how did you do that? They say, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I was in the zone. I was in the, is, do you get in the zone? Yeah. It's right. kind of hard not to when uh, the corners are flying around. You right. pick your points and make sure you hit them. <laughs> <laughs> How long have you actually been racing, Chris? Uh, about three years now. Three and a half years, I think. And and anything like track days or anything before that? I've done a few track days to build up to it. Yeah. Um, but then I found it towards the end because I started getting faster and faster. Um I found that a lot of guys that were out on the circuit were, um, I don't know, they, they, when you took them, they ended up trying to push harder because you can do it. Right. And I, I got taken off a few times because people were, uh, you, you could see that what it was was because I went round them quickly. Yeah. They thought, well, a guy with one arm can do it. I can do it. Gotcha. And then they end up out breaking themselves and they can't actually control what they're actually doing. And I've been taken off a few times uh, on the track days towards the end of my my track daying. And um, again, I didn't feel fast, fast. I felt like I was okay, but not fast, fast. And yeah, then I, I basically thought, well, it's getting to that point. I want to be with people who have good track track etiquette. And the only way to get that is racing. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, and then I found out what fast is. You always wanted to do racing before your accident. It wasn't kind of like, oh, now I've had an accident, I'm going to prove to everybody and myself that I can do even more. But you always wanted to be a racer, and that's what you carried on to do. Yeah, yeah. The thing is, I mean, when the accident happened, it was one of those where, I mean, I just wanted to stay in the army for the rest of my life. And Yeah, yeah. yeah, and that got taken away, and I knew it was going to get taken away. So yeah. it kind of just forced me into, well, the only other love that I had was motorbikes. Thank you for your service. Thank you very much. You're welcome. More than welcome, yeah. sir. More than welcome. <laughs> In fact, cheers. I'm going to drink. Well, you can't see it, can you? That's my... It, it's, it's kind not, of trying. It's yeah, orange juice. Yeah. <laughs> it's just orange juice, honestly. It's not vodka yeah. in that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are you sure? <laughs> I promise you, I don't drink vodka. Well... No, tequila, yeah, maybe, but vodka. Yeah, no. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing is impossible, you just need to figure it out. back 
to the racing side of things because that's what you do a lot of and we'll come on to some of the other things that i know you've got planned on the side you're a very busy guy chris you've got a lot going on you've got a young family you're racing you've got other things in the in the pipeline where do you find your energy uh i i think it's just brute force and ignorance most of the time yeah um yeah it definitely does feel like it's taken its toll a lot of the time um I've seen what you do on a weekend when you have to go and race. And I mean, how does your other half feel about you going away racing at weekends? Or does she come with you? Or is it difficult to, to, to keep that up? Um, yeah, she's fine with it as far as I'm aware. I'm get, I know it's hard when I go away because she stays at home with uh, my young lad. Yeah. Um, she used to come to the races to start off with um, for the first couple, but then she got pregnant at the time and um, we did try it with um, our youngster and it just it is quite difficult going away and because he, all he wants to do is play with me and it's like I'm trying to get ready to go out on the race and yeah I feel kind of gutted that I, I can't play with him as much when I'm away when he wants to yeah, yeah so yeah. they tend to stay at home when I go now yeah, so yeah, yeah. when he gets a little bit older I'm sure he'll be wanting to come but Definitely. I think he does need to have a little bit more know how before he goes because he yeah. did like trying to touch my bike when it, when we're warming it up and things so it was like well mm. got to be careful do you yeah. feel you know if your son wants to uh, take up motorcycling when he gets older well to be honest um, I'd be, I wouldn't make him get an interest if he does get an interest I'll support it yeah um, I think it'll be quite similar to I mean I was a bit of a reprobate uh, I always did what I wanted kind of thing and um yeah, and I'll I tell you what, some of the things I ended up doing, it, it's obviously put a lot of strain on my parents and th things. Um, so oh, I, yeah. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't encourage him to do something he doesn't, but if he wants to do it, I'm, I'm not going to stop him from doing it either. So, Chris, when you was, um, before you had your accident, Matt, when you went out on a motorcycle, did you push the boundaries a bit? Not really, if I'm honest, because I know that, it, I mean, obviously the bikes I have as well doesn't really say that. I suppose like most bikers, they get carried away for five, ten minutes. Yeah. Um, but I wouldn't do that all the time because no. the traffic is so much, there's so much road furniture around and everything else. It's not really... Um, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not conducive to want to stay on the planet for very long, is it? No, <laughs> no. no. So um, let's talk about what you're doing right now. So obviously the, the virus that we've all been hit with has put your motorcycle racing back this year. I mean, how many uh, are you going to fit in a, a full season now or what's, what's going to happen? Well, the full season this year is going to be four races. So as opposed to what's it normally? Ten? I think it's nine. Nine. Yeah. I think might be eight possibly. Uh, yes. Yeah, nine or eight. So. Okay. So you, you'll get those in. Are they all going to be spectatorless, do you think? Uh, I know Donington's going to be, um, which is at the end of the month. Um, There'll be a Brands Hatch? Uh, trying to think. No, not this year. Um, I think the, well, the calendar's changed again. Okay. So I think end of the month, it's Donington. Next month, it's Mallory Park now. Uh, month after is... Alton Park and then the last race of the season will be um, Cadwell Park so yeah they've changed it slightly um, yeah. but it's just all going to be well with the spectators it's just going to be down to when the virus is more under control I suppose and like you you came into racing you're quite old really to get into racing are you would you say I'm not, I don't mean that disrespectfully yeah. but no I did yeah yeah. most are yeah. coming up through the kiddie ranks you know and they're going you know, all, all the way from like I don't know, three or four years old now, kids are racing, aren't they? So, yeah, are the guys around you, you know, if, if they've been in it for you know three quarters of their life already and they're only in their mid 20s and 30s, or yeah, there's quite a few of them, yeah, and you can definitely tell because I mean, some of the, the guys are absolutely in incredible, absolutely yeah. incredible, yeah. and I mean, the amount of talent they've got, it's just it's quite awe inspiring to be honest. Yeah, and it makes me want to push harder because, well, I mean, if they can do it, I know I'll never be on the pace of them. But the closer I can get to it, the better. For me, motorbike. 
bikes gave me a reason to live again. And for me, the Alaman TT is the pinnacle of racing. It is the hardest race. And I, I really just want to get there and, and actually compete in it. And that's my, my goal. The difference really is, I mean, apart from, we know it's skills and that, but it's, it's that experience that someone has had for such a, a long time. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. The, the thing is, I mean, they most of them have probably come up through the 125s to the 250s, 300s, and then 500, 600s, and then they've gone on to thousands. And over the, the time, they've managed to get all that experience of all the different types of bikes. Yeah. When they do go to that level, they are... They're, they're a slice above the rest and as for me coming in quite late I'm doing okay but I'll never be able to get to that standard because I'll never get that experience before my time's uh, so the race is going to be out what kind of training have you had to do apart from actually being on the track do you employ other kinds of training to help you I don't know sharpen your mind improve your reflexes up your fitness do you do other things to help you to improve mainly just work on my fitness yeah um, although lately it's kind of gone out the window I mean with this whole quarantine thing it's uh, I've gone completely the opposite way I was really training quite hard to get ready for the first race of the season yeah yeah and as soon as that got cancelled and they said right that's it quarantine it's kind of like well I'll just go drink then it's more so, fatness than fitness. <laughs> yeah, definitely at the moment. So yeah. I got I got another stone and a half to lose, which I didn't really want to be doing, but it just kind of went with along with everything that was happening. I kind of went into a bit of a, I bet, a I bet shell, a, really. I bet a stone and a half m makes quite a difference on your times, does it? Uh, Can it? Yeah, it really does. Yeah. Um, I mean, it does put a more power, a more weight in, on the bike. But then I suppose, I mean, there's... Um, there's a guy that I raced with. He's um, a larger fella. He's absolutely on it. Absolutely right. on it. Yeah. So it's not, I don't know, it's just, I'm still lighter than him, but he can still throw the bike around a hell of a lot better than me. So I think at my sort of level, it doesn't make a huge difference. Yeah. It's just more about just trying to work on my road craft before yeah. I then get uh, better at it, really. Yeah, and then and when I start getting up to those levels where it does make a difference, then yeah, I definitely. Have I just wanted to um, I, that that behind me is your bike. Yeah, tell me about your bike and the kind of mods that you have done on that, if you can. What is it? Um, um, yeah, go on. Yeah, it's a R1 Big Bang, uh, 2010. Yeah. Um, main adaption that I've done on it is. Um, I've literally moved the clutch from the left-hand side to the right-hand side behind the front brake. So I've got the two levers on the one hand. Okay. Um, I've put a quick shifter on it because it was um, it was the models, the model earlier than they actually started putting all the electrics on it. So there's no anti-wheelie, anti-traction, anything like that on it. It's just literally all throttle control. Right. Um, uh, there's a couple of pads on it. Um, I've got a pad on the fuel tank and a pad at the back of the seat. So I've turned the um, bike more into a saddle rather than it being a seat. Because right. I found that um, when I was racing without them, it was just a lot of effort. And I was absolutely knackered after 10 minutes of being on the bike, trying wow. to keep all the weight off the bar and everything else. I right. was just, it was just absolutely killing me doing it. And um, there was a guy at one of the races, that uh, one of the um, tech marshals at one of the races, basically said what about trying it so i did it but well, no he did it sorry mm. i went out and it just made a massive difference because i could take the weight through the tank rather than trying to take it through my core yeah um and i've only got pretty much half a core um the left hand side of my core is um nerve damage right so um, i haven't got a full core to work off okay um, and it was absolutely just absolutely tiring me out so we turned it more into the saddle so I can just take the weight into the bike rather than trying to use all my muscles to hold myself off. 
that's a really good point actually because everybody is always talking about core 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 you know and if you've got something like that on a motorcycle which isn't helping you with the displacement of your body it might, must be exceptionally difficult it does make it a bit harder um i mean gone are the days when i was in the army and i was fit it is quite difficult if i put quite a lot of strain in into my, my core on the left hand side just the yeah. way that it's got to react it is quite painful at times as well what's the kind of top speed you're getting out of that bike uh i think the fastest that i've been clocked at is about 162 but the thing is a lot of people they um see their speedos and think that speedos are accurate um but they're not so okay. there's um there's generally a 10 percent uh difference in between actual speed and your speedo speed yeah so um, especially if you start changing your sprockets on the bike, it will give you a false speed basically on top of your 10%. What so there are a lot of, there's a lot of people out there who think they've done 190 on a track and I don't think there's a track really that you can get that much speed on. Oh, really? Um, yeah. So but this is the more novice type bikers that think they're going out onto a track and whacking out 200 mile an hour or something. In reality, yeah, they, what the, yeah. Well, they're doing it probably about 140. <laughs> There's that much difference. It depends what's happened to the bike, and a lot of people don't. They kind of take the speedo for gospel, yep. whereas really the speedo doesn't actually tell you the proper speed unless you get a, a GPS tracker on it. Yeah, I was going to say like the GPS says 30 mile an hour. I'm doing 27, 28 on the bike. Yeah. Or it's the it's other way around. Cool. Yeah, normally the GPS says about 30 and the um, the clock should be saying about 33. Yeah, that's it. So if I'm doing 20... Yeah. You're the fastest you've gone round a corner on one, round a nice sweeping bend. I think, I wouldn't quote me on it, but it's about 100, 105, I think. See, that scares the pants out of me because I get up to about 50 or something and I'm already like, you know... That's yeah. <laughs> but getting around at that kind of speed. Like before you went on the tracks and started racing, was you already used to being able to lean a bike over far enough to get your knee closer to the ground? Yeah, I could get my knees down on the yeah. um, on the uh, bikes on the road as well. Yeah. But then it was it was more in the national speed limits. And to be fair, yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I could throw the bike around a bit, yeah. but yeah. never to this level. I watched some of the things you guys... Now, I came to watch you one time at Brands Hatch, and it was absolutely hissing down. I mean, we're talking <laughs> stair rods. And yet, <laughs> you're still flying around. Like, how do you cope with that? With the I, I, Look, I know you can ride a bike in the rain, but this is exceptional. And just even being able to see, to see where you're going. It, it's, yeah, it's quite difficult. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just find that I close my eyes more. Yeah. <laughs> oh dear. Dear, oh dear. You had a good season last year. Yeah. Yeah, Finished. it was. So does that mean you move up this year or you stay in the same league or? No, still in the same class. Um, so I'm still in GP1 Sport. If I'm honest, even the idea of stepping up to the next class, it's, um, yeah, it's uh, quite daunting because the guys, um, was it? it's like even things like I was doing a, 52 second lap round brands hatch around the indie circuit the fast boys in the uh, class above are doing like a 46 second lap so there is quite a, a gap between what i can do and they can do yeah and uh, the last thing i want to do is be a hindrance to to the race yeah i sure. still want to get up to a good standard before i then go to the next level yeah because you still want to have that chance of in the co in the competition to be able to hang on in there and work your way up through the i guess through the season you know to getting closer to the the front runners or at least not that season but the, by the next one yeah but you you told me that you wanted to do um the isle of man tt circuit to actually yeah. grace the circuit not not just ride around it but to actually be um, the first per first person with one arm to race the Isle of Man TT circuit, is that right? And that's still your goal? The Manx GP has been done by a guy called Chris Mitchell. Yeah, he lives on the actual island. And he raced the Manx GP with one arm on an SV650. Did he? And, yeah, and it's funny because, well, yeah, it's, it's kind of funny because um, 
yeah. I went out to the Manx, Manx GP in 2013 when he did it. And because I was there with the army team, I was kind of more focused on the army team. And I right. remember hearing about him, but never actually paid that much attention. Okay. And then it wasn't until I, I had my accident that I actually ended up meeting people who were in the same boat and actually doing the same thing that I wanted to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which gave me the encouragement to do it. Right. And I spoke to a guy called Danny Campion who races an R1 with one leg and one arm. All right. And again, to me, it was just like, well, Jesus, I mean, I, I genuinely have no excuse. No. And then I found out that Chris Mitchell raced it. Well, I obviously knew, but didn't really pay attention to it. But again, even a week or two when I came out of hospital, I found out, but well, I knew that he wanted, he raced the Isle Man. My goal before the accident was to go road racing. Yeah. And I've tried to keep that goal to myself. Well, and just keep going with it. And I mean, all I want to do is just be competitive there. I mean, the, I'm, I'm never going to be the front runner. I'm never going to be winning the championships. And I know that's not going to be possible because my limitations. Yeah. But as long as I can be competitive in what I'm doing and actually compete, I mean, to, to get the honor of actually riding there is going to be a, but, a slice above yeah. a lot of people anyway. Yeah, I was going to say it's um, it's beyond the capabilities of most people to get up to that level and be able to do something like that. So, like you said, even just getting there and being able to compete that that is a massive. When you look back at your life and say, "Well, I, I raced at XXX and I did this," and you know, are, are people going to stand there and go, "But did you win?" No. Well, no. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's going to say, "Well done." Well done. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. Yeah. Because we we do we do have this fixation on winning is everything, but it's not. You can see where the taking part as well is so much as important as just the winning. You yeah. Know, it's important that we remember that. Otherwise, people <laughs> don't want to do anything. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Yeah. But the thing is, I mean, I know that. I mean, Jesus when Peter Hickman did his 134 mile, well, 35 mile an hour lap, I'm never going to be able to do that. And I know I'm not. No. And I mean, just, yeah, to be able to go around it and do it in a good time, yeah. which a lot of people can't do, I'm quite happy with. And if yeah. I'm not last, even better. Yeah. <laughs> it's the only man that's ever kissed Lizzie while I've been with her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The only other man. <laughs> You got a kiss off him one day, and I went, "All right, fair enough." We'll let that one slide. <laughs> just, just. <laughs> Sports bike aside, racing aside, you've got some other plans in motorcycling, haven't you? What else are you doing? Well, I, I've started becoming a motorbike instructor. Yeah, I, I, I have come across a few people who've, who've struggled to find schools to uh, actually go and learn. At the end of the day, if a bike's adapted to you, what's the difference between you and anyone else? Are, are, um, you, are you talking specifically about people that have a difference that, or a disability? Is that what you're going to specialise in? Or? I, I will be to everyone. I yeah. mean, it's not going to be all set to one person. No. But if I can help someone else out who is in a different position, yeah, then, yeah, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to take them on and actually train them up. Yeah, because um, I mean, as you know, Lizzie has, has struggled to find somebody who can understand yeah. um, the psychological aspect as well as the physical aspect. Because there are some great instructors out there, and we, oh yeah, we, definitely, yeah. And we and we've been with a few guys down at Art Rider Training in Basildon, and they've been immense. But yeah. no one will ever ever understand unless you're, you're in the same position. Yeah. Or a similar position, yeah. Yeah. And there aren't many, if any, there are definitely none around us, any specialists with people that can help people like that. It just don't, it's just not around. Yeah, it's quite difficult to come across. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those that when you look in the right places, you will find it. Yeah. And if you're passionate about something, you will find it. I mean, I know it, I, I'm quite passionate about helping people if I can. And if I can help, I will. And I know there are, there are a lot of other people out there who are in the same position. So and is, is this another sideline for you or is this going to be like a full-time career, do you think, Chris? Uh, it's going to be a full-time career. 
so good for you, man. Good. yeah there's quite a lot of dreams that I've got it's just trying to take them off one at a time at the moment but yeah, yeah, yeah. it seems to be quite overwhelming at the moment it's just literally every day there's something else to do right so yeah. it's uh, it's literally no rest for the wicked at the moment <laughs> well d do it while you're, you're the age that you are now my friend because uh, if you wait till you're older it gets so much harder but <laughs> yeah <laughs> is nothing is impossible you just need to figure it out and the thing is there's a probably a lot of people out there who well it may be a bit difficult for a lot of what they want to be doing but what i would say to them is just to actually go and try something because the thing that you try may actually be the missing part of you and then you can actually find that you are um, having that missing part can heal the mind and the more you heal the mind, the more you heal the body. So if you do have a chance to go and actually try something new, I would do it. Because it could be, that's what you want, that could be your calling. And how, how so how long have you got left of your motorcycle training before you uh, pass out as an instructor? Basically, we're waiting on uh, the radios at the moment. We've tried a few different things and it's quite quite difficult because most of the radios that get used are the you got a press to talk button on the handlebar um, and because voice I've got control the, that's yeah we've tried it we've tried one but it doesn't it doesn't work as well as we were hoping especially when I'm trying to focus on everything it just it was quite difficult to have that on top right so we bought some bluetooth radios to give them a go and it's the ones the uh, DVSA use we're going to see about using them and see how well they work and hopefully that's it yeah. and once i've done a, a few road rides and actually taken the road rides um i should well hopefully good enough to get a tick in the box and start training on cbt so yeah yeah absolutely absolutely i'm sure you will there you know where there's a will there's a way you, you you'll find it but it is interesting that you what you're saying about because um it's like Lizzie points out to me, you can't just go and do something. There's always got to be, a, and that must get so frustrating. It must get frustrating. Uh, I don't know. It's It's got its moments. It's normally the simple things that frustrate me. Anything that's a bit more than simple, it does make you think about how to do it. Yeah. I mean, even just putting a nut on the back of a bolt. Yeah. It's just little things, like, little things like that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I've given up tying my shoelaces. I can do it, but I prefer not to. So yeah. it's just little things like that. That that, that does frustrate me. Velcro, so Chris. To do it. Velcro. Yeah, and then I get to look like a big toddler again. <laughs> <laughs> so I was going to ask you, like changing changing the subject completely. When did you first get into motorcycling? What was your first bike? Why did you get that bike? And what was your first experience of motorcycling? So what, when was it and how was it? This makes quite a few people laugh. When I was about eight, I went on the back of my uncle's bike and it was a 95 or 94, a 95 Fireblade. Nice. Yeah, I, I fell in love with it. It was awesome. Mm. But obviously I had to wait before I could get a license. Then when I got to about 17, I always wanted to get a little 125. But my parents said didn't didn't want me to do it. By this point, I done, I'd done a tour of Af Afghanistan come yeah. back and I said I want to do it again parents basically said still no they're too dangerous yeah just one day I came back went into the garage and there was a Harley Davidson in there my mum's gone out and got a Harley Davidson really <laughs> yeah because uh, she used to ride when she was younger and she yeah she, she went out and got a Harley right. and then my dad started uh, doing his license to get his bike license and then ended up being two Harleys so the Harley so they bought you a Harley no, 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 no. Oh. Um, they they got two because my dad wanted to get one. So I turned around and well, I'm getting my license then. And they were like, yeah, well, we can't say no now. I was like, no, you can't. <laughs> so um, I went off and literally the only reason why I got my bike license was to get a Harley Davidson. Did you get one? So, no. <laughs> uh, my first bike was the Yamaha Virago. Oh, okay. The 535. Nice. Nicknamed the ladies version. So, the they um, were nice bikes, the Viragos. Nice yeah, bikes. they are. Oh, yeah. I like it. Yeah. I've still got it. Oh, <laughs> yeah. have you? <laughs> yeah. 
it's got a little bit of work to do on it. Um, but on yeah, no, I, I want to get back. So they go on forever. Then bikes, then Viragos. You can still pick them up on the uh, internet now. Yeah, I know. It was the just... thing is, my engine's only got five thousand miles on the clock. Wow. Yeah, so it's basically a brand new engine as well. I, they are becoming collector's pieces in good condition. They're collector's pieces then, Viragos. I remember yeah. my mate had one, and I went on the back of it years ago. Uh, I think he had a 750. Did they do a 7? Yeah. yeah, they did a 750. Yeah. They? And they were like the first, in my mind, they were the first non-Harley cruiser yeah. bike. Yeah. Yeah. They at like the same Harley. time, Suzuki and Honda all came out with their own as well. Yeah, and yeah it was like, Shadow and... Yeah, then like yeah. intruders and things. I, I think it was an intruder. Yeah. So, yeah. So your so, first bike was a Virago. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. And literally, <laughs> I, I had it for about two months. And again, never even wanted to get anywhere near a super sport or a super bike. Don't know, I just kind of wanted to go down the sit sit down and plod route. And um, my best mate was in the uh, Marines at the time. Yeah. And he was looking at getting a Ducati. So he was going to sell his R6. And uh, he managed to convince me to buy it off of him. Oh, wow. So I ended up on an R6. So it was a bit of a jump going from a Virago to an R6. Not many. Definitely scared <laughs> the pants off me. Even just pulling away from a set of traffic lights, just normally it was like, but hey. <laughs> so you wouldn't go back to the Harley then? You wouldn't, the Harley route, would you still consider that one of them? Yeah, I would. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think so you're not you're not a bike snob. You don't stick to one thing and that's it then, and everybody else's is no good. You're a... No, I, I, yeah, yeah. Anyway, any two wheels. Yeah. Um, I'm really not that fussed. Yeah. Um, the thing is, I mean, it would be nice to have a... Just, I don't know, it's just having that different position change your whole look when you go on the bike. Yeah. I mean, when you're on a super bike, you, you're having fun. Yeah. It's just a bike to enjoy because of the bike whereas kind of sat on a, a cruiser yeah you, you can plod along but you can take in the scenery a little bit. well that's perfect for me because i tell you what i cannot sit in that super bike position for more than 20 minutes because my knees are shot yeah. my back's <laughs> shot my neck's shot my wrists hurt and I'm yeah. like, no, give me a cruise. I've got a big old Triumph Thunderbird now, which is like, you know, just like a Harley Davidson, except it's a Triumph. No, I, I, I mean, I've, I've just got an MT-07 Tracer now. So, That's nice. yeah, I've still got my, um, well, because I've got the two R1s. I've still got my, my road R1 still, because yeah. I, I, I do like it. It's I don't think I will ever part with it. No. Um, but it's nice to have that and then, the idea of sitting on more of a tour uh, like it's a sports adventure isn't it so yeah lovely bikes yeah it's just nice and yeah i definitely can tell i've been riding that this year when i got back on my race bike yesterday really i could i couldn't even find my foot pegs really yeah because <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i have two bikes so if i ride one on the same if i ride one for a few days and then get on the other one i mean i did have a harley a while back i don't know if i told you about that so if you could have any bike, any bike, money was not an option. And I'm talking about a road bike. I'm not talking about a, a race special or anything. What would you go into the showroom and pick out? I honestly don't know. I, I don't think I could say. Do you favor uh, a, um, like a, a manufacturer? Like do you carry uh, Yamaha? Yamaha? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you'd be looking at the Yamaha dealers at least. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah, I just um, yeah, I don't know. I just fell in love with Yamaha. I've tried other bikes and yeah, I, I mean, I got along with some of them, but yeah, I don't know. It's just Yamaha has always ticked all the boxes for me. I think it's just a common thing with bikers. They tend to mm. favour one make because it suits what they want. Yeah, and yeah, I mean each each manufacturer has their own pros and cons. What, um, would, you, what would you rate more, performance or looks on a, on a bike that you want to buy for the road? For the road, would you go more for looks or would you go probably more the handling? You would go for the performance. Yeah, okay. yeah. So yeah, it, it it needs to handle right. 
yeah. because obviously being a little bit more in a more tough position. Sure, yeah, sure. It, um, yeah, it definitely has to be, well, comfortable, really. Yeah, yeah, has yeah. Be comfortable on it. So, uh, so what's your message to people out there then, Chris? What's your message? It was a Japanese guy. For the life of me, I can't remember his name, but he, he did say that nothing is impossible. You just have to figure it out. And I swear by it. Yeah. I, I believe that the second you think it's not doable, it's you might as well kind of give up. And if you think that the sky's your limit, you will only go to the space. Yeah. So, and I've just sworn by that that motto ever since I heard it. So, yeah. then I can see that you're definitely following that kind of path, Chris. Yeah, one hundred percent. Well, I am but, trying. <laughs> Chris, it's yeah. it's been a pleasure having you on. Yeah, no, thank you. It's great to see you. Great to talk to you. If people want to follow you you've got your website what's your website's name is it uh it's chris uh chris ganley racing.com chris ganley racing.com and you're on instagram yeah are you on youtube as well uh i've got a few videos on youtube and it's under ganosaurus rex oh ganosaurus uh, rex. so yeah my mate nick me nicknamed me in uh headley court because apparently with this i haven't got much reach <laughs> like a t-rex so, <laughs> Ganosaurus Rex on YouTube. Do you upload much stuff on there, Chris, or are you just bits and bobs down again? Normally, after my races, I will put up all my races, whether yeah. they've been good or bad. Just yeah, yeah I'll put them all up. Um, so there hasn't been much for a while, um, but hopefully you, there'll be more coming up soon. You get the camera on on your bike on the race. Yeah, I normally have a, a GoPro on my yoke yeah. facing through the screen. Awesome. So, yeah, so at least I can look back on my footage and just find where I'm weaker and better. I wouldn't mind going on a track day one day. Well, to be honest, I do have to say, I think if doing a track day, you can go into novice and, I mean, it's it's not it's not fast, fast. It's just a little bit quicker than the roads. And yeah, I think you get more of a feel for your bike right. actually doing a track day. So when you you actually get more confident with it because you are trying to maybe break that a little bit later or trying to lean the bike a little bit more than you used to. And it's just a safe environment to do it. Well, safer environment to do it. Um, Chris, it's been an absolute pleasure. You've given up a good out of well, best part of two hours really of your time to have a chat to me i know you're busy with your kids and your missus they don't get to see you that much so yeah. <laughs> i think you need to leave me and once again thanks very much chris and yeah, I, no look problem. For, thank you I look, I look forward to coming and seeing you um racing and um you look after yourself buddy yeah and yourself yeah and as i said send my love to uh lizzie for me as well please i will do absolutely <laughs> She, she loves you to bits, mate. She's always talking about you. <laughs> it was actually quite worried. funny because um, uh, Lass turned up uh, to do a CBT. Or was it? No, it wasn't. It was to go onto a big bike. Mm. And she basically said that she was encouraged to go onto the big bike because she follows a Lass on Instagram with one arm. Ah. And I went, oh, okay. I said, oh, well, do you remember her name? She goes, I. Oh, I vaguely reckon I can't really remember it right now. I said, Oh, is it the bionic biker by any chance? And he went, That's it. That's I went, it. Yeah. I, I um yeah, I, I I was talking to her and encouraging her to get onto the bike. So yeah, I said it was me that encouraged her to do what she did. So in theory I've kind of encouraged you. Yeah. And she looked at me and was like, Oh right. <laughs> <laughs> well all this all this has been set up because of Lizzie, you know, and she is involved in it all. She'll be involved in the editing and talking to people. You know, if we yeah. come over to see you, she'll be more involved in talking to you and you know, we'll probably come and see you another time and do some proper filming and stuff. But with everything that's going on, like this is perfect, yeah, isn't cool. it? Well, hopefully it'll be the next brand's hatch. Well, it's a shame it's not happening this year. Yeah, it was going to be the opening round. And I'm really, really excited for it because I did because I did the 52 second round there. Yeah. I've um, I've changed the bike a little bit, right. so I was I was hoping to get into the the sub 50 marker. Yeah. yeah. And that was my aim. 
and yeah, I was a bit gutted that I couldn't give it a go and see how close I can get. Oh well. Yeah. Good old COVID for you. <laughs> Let's not talk about that, eh? Because I think yeah, we, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want to start frying things, do we? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right, Chris. Yeah. Been a pleasure, right. my man. Yeah, take care, all right? Yeah, take care of yourself. Right. See ya. Bye bye. 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 Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for watching. My name's Neil. This has been the Motor Chat Show. I hope you enjoyed the show tonight and stay tuned. We've got lots more coming up. Many more people coming online. They're just like you and me, but they have some exceptional stories. So take care. Please, if you can, like, share and subscribe. It means a hell of a lot to us and it just means it gives us incentive to keep bringing awesome people to you with awesome stories take care guys ride safe till next time bye